I'm Gordon Stewart, and this is episode 9 of Tales from Weird Scotland. The stories told in Tales from Weird Scotland relate to the supernatural and may detail dark and distressing events from Scotland's past. For this reason, the podcasts are not recommended for younger people or any other listener who may find such content upsetting. Culloden I doubt if it is possible for an English person to comprehend what it means to be a Jacobite. One is born a Jacobite or one is not. I was born a Jacobite and I never lose my passionate love and regret for the sufferings and sorrows of Prince Charles Edward. Had I lived during the 45, I would have worn the white cockade and parted with my last shift for the love of Bonnie Prince Charlie. One must be Scotch to understand that the Union did nothing to unite England and Scotland. To the Scottish ploughman, the Englishman is still a foreigner whom he dislikes. Scotch and English servants do not work well in the same house. To us, Mary Queen of Scots lived uh, only the other day. When the House of Stuart passed from us, our history ended. Not written, as you may have thought perhaps, in the aftermath of the last Jacobite uprising of 1745-1746. These words were penned in the aftermath of the Great War in 1919. Created by the hand of the publishing heiress Violet Tweeddale, born of the famous Chambers Scottish Publishing dynasty, Violet Tweeddale wrote these lines in her best-selling book, Ghosts I Have Seen. Remembering a sighting of the Bonnie Prince himself apparently at Tarbot and seen by Lady Cromarty. The dashing prince had, seemingly, appeared in the grand house occupied for a shooting party. Talk of the Jacobite cause had tugged at many of the guests' heartstrings. Strongly enough to summon the prince in spirit form to show his approval? Maybe. Maybe not. The story is interesting in that it highlights the romantic and strong emotions that the Jacobite uprising could, can, provoke. And in these politically charged days of 2021, they show how history can be, is, used as a tool for powerful emotional and political arguments. Now, Tweeddale herself deserves an episode of Tales from Weird Scotland all to herself. A high society socialite, author, poet and spiritualist, she would write a number of books on hauntings, spirits and spirituality. The Cosmic Christ is one of her titles that leaps off the shelf. And she seems to have been breathily delighted that her hero, Prince Charles Edward, would make himself known to her own social circle. She also collected and wrote ghost stories, particularly those set in the grand country houses and castles of her social set. Member of the Order of the Golden Dawn, a keen golf player, amateur artist, pianist, embroiderer and advocate of workers' rights, her psychic abilities were seemingly famed at the time. Friend to Robert Browning and Frederick Leighton, colleague of Helena Blavatsky and Conan Doyle, 
This Edinburgh woman was, to say the least, busy. In her book, she goes on to note that affection and regret for the Jacobite cause remained strong in many old Scottish houses, with one dusty old chamber recalled as being filled with portraits of the prince, silk white cockades, locks of the royal hair, and, in that house in summer, a tall glass vase into which is placed a single white rose, the symbol of the ill-fated House of Stuart and the final Jacobite uprising. Prince Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, has inspired legends ever since the uprising that is often remembered simply as the 45. His figure, or rather a figure clad in tartan of various hues, was recorded at the now demolished County Hotel in Dumfries in the 1930s and also in Culloden House near Inverness. Tales of his adventures inspired the writers Sir Walter Scott in the 19th century and Nigel Tranter in the 20th, and continue to echo down to us today. It's satisfying to note that Violet Tweedale mentions both Charles Edward Stuart and his great-great-great-grandmother, Mary, Queen of Scots. Two romantic, romanticised members of the long-lived Stuart dynasty, which ruled Scotland from 1371 and then Scotland and England together from 1603 to 1714, and would reign over the merger of both these kingdoms into the single Great Britain in 1707, the Union. Both figures lost in history, surrounded by folklore, rumour and legend. Possibly the two most soap opera-like figures from Scotland's past, but two still able to provoke passionate arguments to this day. Forced into exile in 1688, King James VII had fled with his family to France. His followers, hoping to help him regain the thrones of Scotland and England, and then Great Britain, became labelled as Jacobites, from the Latin for his name, James, Jacobus. Jacobus. Both his son and grandson, the Jacobite kings James VIII and then King Charles III, or the old and the young pretender, depending on your point of view of course, would both try and fail to regain their kingdom. In 1715, the exiled Prince James Francis, the James VIII for some, father of our bonnie prince, led one of the Jacobite uprisings. It failed, and those who were witness remembered that the prince's standard, his flag, had fallen to the ground when he first gathered his supporters together. There and then, his doom had been proclaimed. In Scotland, their supporters would conceal their loyalties through secret signs and codes. At dinner, when toasts to the ruling monarch were commonplace and expected, the Jacobites would, as is well known, toast the king, but made sure to pass the glass they raised over another glass or basin filled with water. In this way, symbolically at least, they were toasting the king over the water, that is, King James in exile over the sea in France. An earlier, more cryptic toast was made to the little gentleman in velvet. An early Jacobite toast, this paid tribute to the molehill 
which tripped the horse of William of Orange, causing him to fall, which would hasten his death. The mole, or little gentleman in velvet, had therefore unwittingly helped kill off the usurper of the Stuarts. Coded names and symbols were used in the hidden letters and messages sent between the exiled Stuarts and their supporters. The amiable young stranger was one name used for Prince Charles Edward Stuart. Blackbird was another. Prince Charles Edward, the Charles III of the Jacobite cause, would lead an army almost to victory in 1745-6, arriving in Scotland and gathering support throughout the Highlands, taking the city of Edinburgh and then marching into England as far south as Derby. At Glenfinnan, his Jacobite banner was raised, and Charles waited for the overwhelming support he expected from the Scots and their French allies. He was disappointed by the support shown from the clans. The French support promised would never be fulfilled. The clans of Cameron of Lochiel, the Macdonalds of Kepoch and Clan Ranald, the Macdonalds of Loch Garry, the Stuarts of Ardshiel, the Gordons of Glenbuchet, the Grants of Glen Morriston, these would be the first to rally to his cause. One of the great what ifs in history, had he ignored his general's advice to retreat and had he continued south, he would almost certainly have taken London and the House of Hanover, the Protestant monarchs who had replaced the House of Stuart, would have been vanquished. Had the promised French support arrived, the history of Britain would have been very different indeed. There may have been no Britain at all. Instead, the dwindling, exhausted Jacobite army retreated to Scotland and to the Highlands. The Royal Navy blockade of Scotland and the lack of money and food for the Jacobites taking its toll. At Dromossy Moor, better known now as Culloden, their fate would be sealed. April 16th, 2021 the 275th anniversary of the Battle of Culloden. The last pitched battle to be fought on the island of Britain, it has become somewhat notorious. Not for the bloodshed on the day of fighting, although that was horrific enough, with over 1,000 deaths among the Jacobite forces and 300 on their opponent's side. No. The notoriety stems from what happened afterwards, with tales of atrocities, of butchery of the wounded, and barbarity directed towards the local population. Much of the history has become lost in myth and politics, but what is clear, no quarter was given. The battle itself lasted around one hour. The result? Decades, if not centuries. The British government forces ordered homes and farms to be burned, Highlanders to be banished into exile to the British Empire's penal colonies. Again, myth and legend surround the true history in part. The Duke of Cumberland, the son of the King, King George, leading the government forces, suggested branding captured men from clans Cameron and Macdonald, branded on the forehead with a letter Z, so these rebels would always be visible. The plan was not, however, put to action. The Duke of Cumberland was named Baron Culloden with thanks from his father, King George II. What is true, though, is that the fleeing Prince Charles Edward saw the end of his dreams of gaining a crown 
at Dromosimur. A high price on his head, he wandered the highlands for some time, taking refuge where he could. No highlander betrayed him for the reward. He escaped into exile forevermore. You can find many isolated secret places where he is said to have taken refuge, including many caves. Meanwhile, the British government issued a number of laws aimed at pacifying or controlling the troublesome highlands. The wearing of tartan, except for loyal soldiers of the British army, and the speaking of Gaelic were prohibited by law. The great Highland bagpipe was declared to be an instrument of war, confiscated from the Highlanders, like their swords and pistols. A massive fort was built on the Murray Firth, Fort George, from which the British army could control the country, linked by efficient new military roads, in many ways similar to the Roman occupation of the South centuries before. The commander of the British army at Culloden, King George II's son, William, Duke of Cumberland, was hailed as a hero at his return to London, at first at least. The flower, Sweet William, was named in his honour. In parts of Scotland, this flower became known as Stinking Billy, and the epithet of the butcher is still used to refer to him today, especially in the Highlands. The hope of a revolution was ended. The Stuarts were removed as a threat until they became little more than a nostalgic memory gracing many a shortbread tin lid. By 1919, when Violet Tweeddale wrote her story, they were long gone. However, stories of less earthy reminders of the tragedy of Culloden began to be recorded, and ghosts connected with the Jacobite uprising have been recorded for a very long time. Many witnesses, many visitors, have reported things near Culloden, hearing the sounds of battle, or have witnessed visions of the battle, including from the train to Inverness. Similar stories, including a strange red glow in the sky, are reported about the earlier Jacobite grisly battlefield of Killacranky. Near to the Battle of Culloden, at the battle site, local people have recorded hearing the sounds of men and horses travelling past them when no one is there. This also includes the sounds of a latecomer running up behind trying to catch up with their comrades. At Culloden Moor, the later carved stones bearing the names of the fallen are chilling in their simplicity. Clan McGillivray, Clan McNaughton, Clan McLean, Clan McLaughlin, the Athol Highlanders, Clan Stuart of Appen, Clan McIntosh, Clan Cameron, the Frasers, the Campbells, and others. The English. Apparitions near the Culloden Well of the Dead have been reported, and it is said that descendants of the fallen are especially prone to experiencing such visions. Given the dramatic impact of the uprising on Gaelic, Highland culture, it is little wonder that many feel the tragedy as keenly as if it were only the other day, talking of their ancestors who fought here by name. Prince Charles Edward himself, in addition to appearing before Lady Cromarty at Tarbot, was said, is said, to appear at the Salutation Hotel in Perth, a grand building dating from the late 1600s, the prince stopped here during the uprising, and his shade is said to wait, watching, 
looking out of a window down towards the street. The ancient Thunderton house in Elgin was also the temporary home of the prince for many days before Culloden, and here too he is said to return. It's now a pub, so well worth visiting, when it is once again safe to do so, of course. Sometime before the return of the prince and the start of the 45, in Dean Castle, Kilmarnock, the servants of the household were terrified by an apparition of the head of their master, the fourth Earl of Kilmarnock, rolling around the floor of the great stone-flagged kitchen. Rushing to tell their lord, the servants were sure that he was doomed. Apparently, many years before 1745, this story was shared with the Earl of Galloway, who verified it later. When the prince did arrive, and the revolt began in 1745, Lord Kilmarnock joined him, becoming his privy councillor and general in the Jacobite army. Captured after Culloden, he was one of the many Jacobite lords beheaded for treason, and thus fulfilled the premonition of his end many years before. Premonition is sometimes a theme of the weird tales connected with the 45. At Culloden House, mentioned before, lived a very important man. Duncan Forbes was a tall, sombre-looking man, his thin features framed by the tight curls of his long wig. A gentle man by all accounts, he was nevertheless a shrewd lawyer and politician, Lord Advocate, Lord President of the Court of Session and a staunch supporter of the Hanoverian regime and of the British Union. He had travelled back to Culloden House, his ancestral home, to avoid the feverish mood in Edinburgh when the Jacobites had seized the city. He met with a neighbouring nobleman at his home and, standing staring out of the window, he is said to have remarked, all these things may fall out, but depend on it. All these disturbances will be terminated on this spot. His view was directed towards Dramossi Moor. He may, of course, have meant that the rule of law would be reimposed, but perhaps, perhaps, he knew or felt something else. Prince Charles Edward would occupy his house before the battle, the Duke of Cumberland afterwards. Captured Jacobite soldiers were executed in the garden of the house after the battle. More were taken to nearby Inverness and imprisoned in the castle there. One local laird was hanged for his part in the uprising from an old apple tree near the town hall. According to local tradition, the tree began to wither and die within days afterwards. Another nobleman whose fate was sealed the moment the government army was victorious was Simon Fraser, 11th Lord Lovett. A character, if ever there was one, who was one of the many to swap sides several times throughout. Fraser fled Culloden for his ancestral lands, taking refuge on a small island on Loch Morar. The British army, the Redcoats, spent months tracking down the rebels, and they discovered him hiding in a hollow tree on the little island. Shipped off to the Tower of London, he holds the dubious honour of being the last man beheaded for treason in Britain. Prince Charles Edward escaped back to France and on to exile. Eager to try again, the prince would be frustrated by lack of support, and even if, according to legend, he travelled back to Scotland incognito, 
he would never again lead an uprising. He died in exile in 1788 at the age of 67. But he still commands strong emotions, passions to this very day. Given the hopes and fears of 1745-1746, the impact of the outcome that was felt far from Dromossi Moor for so very long, it is little wonder that tales of ghosts, echoes from the past, should continue to this day. Thank you for listening. Until next time, sleep tight. That was Gordon Stewart. This episode was written by Gordon Stewart and featured Barbara Buchanan as Violet Tweedale. This episode was produced and radiophonically designed by me, Nick Cole Hamilton. If you enjoy listening to Tales from Weird Scotland, please like, rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to it. We love to hear what you think, so please do drop us a review and let us know how we're doing. Or find us on Twitter as at Tales Weird. Weird spelled W-Y-R-D. This is a You Better Run Media production. Join us again soon for more Tales from Weird Scotland.